are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the solved case of the Starbucks murders. This is a place many of us know today as the ultimate trendy spot, a place to go work and to get a high dollar cup of coffee. It's known for its peace, coziness, and no one would think that this would be connected with a murder. Yet, we're about to discuss a triple homicide that happened within Starbucks doors. By the way, I post so much content like this. It is my absolute passion to tell these stories, and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if it's something you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up, and leaving a nice comment down below. I also want to announce that it is October, so I'm going to be posting so much this month, and it's all going to be the strangest, most odd cases I can find. They will be posted every Thursday and Sunday at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I have another wonderful announcement, and that is that I have created merch. So here I am wearing one of them right now. This is the little merch design, and it is a skeleton hand holding a gem. And I love it so much. I worked with an artist to create it, and I am so, so pleased with how it turned out. I feel like it encompasses this channel and us together, you know? I feel like the skeleton really is, it goes along with true crime, but it's also the fact that I love that us as a community, we're very different. And no matter our skin color, our sexuality, our religion, to our skeleton, we are the same, you know? We are skeletons. And that means that we need to respect and love each other all the same. And so I think that that really embodies something that I believe in while also being, you know, creepy, true crime related. And then of course we have the giant gem that is for you gems. And I don't know, I just, I really, really love this design. And if it's something that you like, I am selling them. The link will be in the description box. I am selling hoodies, crewnecks, t-shirts, um, phone cases. I have my phone case right here. Isn't it the cutest? I love it on the phone case. And it's also going to be in white design. And there's also going to be another merch design with the words, you're such a genuine gym. If you would rather have the words, I will be wearing that in a video. It just hasn't come in for me yet. So when it does, I will wear it, but I'm so excited. And it would mean the world to see you guys in my merch and to just show your support. So if you do end up getting it, I would love to see photos of you guys in them. You can tag me on Twitter or on Instagram. So yeah, I'm really excited. This is kind of a surprise for us hitting 100,000 that I'm so thankful for. So yeah, let's go ahead and get back to this story. I want to give a huge thank you to a website called so give me coffee and TV history.com. They had a ton of information on this case that I couldn't find elsewhere and it was just much more elaborate so they did a great job of researching and I will have them linked below. So it was 1997 in Washington DC and Marriott Mahoney worked in a neighborhood near Georgetown. This was called Berlith and there was actually a Starbucks in this very low crime area on 1810 Wisconsin Avenue and Mary had actually become the manager there at only 25 years old. Now she had been working there for around two years at this point but Mary Catherine Mahoney actually went by Katie to some of her family. I will be referring to her as Mary because of course I'm not family but a lot of them did call her Katie and they also said that Mary was extremely selfless. I mean she had actually never cried as a baby. She always gave leftover food that she had to the homeless especially when she was working and she was headed home at night. If she saw anybody without food or on the street she would stop and she would give them the leftovers and she also didn't eat meat because she felt so bad for the animals animals. Family and friends really never had a bad thing to say about her. She was the type of beautiful soul who had no problem balancing staying up all night with her friends and, you know, just having like a dance party and also going with her 74-year-old grandmother to hike around Alaska. This was just something that she was good at because she wanted to make everybody happy. 
when family would actually call and get Mary's answering machine, they would be greeted by Mary's voice saying that it was Mary's phone and her cat, Marlou. And that just tells you a lot about her character. She wanted to introduce her own cat on her answering machine. But everyone who knew Mary loved her. There were no exceptions. She had grown up in Baltimore with six siblings and it was a mixed family. There was some step siblings in there because her parents had gotten divorced and then remarried. Although this didn't cause for a chaotic family environment, it was quite happy actually and they all really got along. After graduating high school, she went on to study the women's studies at Towson University and ended up graduating with honors. Her teachers and classmates believed that she could go on to do something amazing and that's also what she planned to do. In 1995, Mary then got an internship at the White House. This was when Bill Clinton was president and she was one of the first ever interns to work in the public liaison's office. But within no time, the director of her internship was so impressed with her. She was one that just did things without having to be told. She would rearrange tables, chairs, telephones, and everything looked perfect. You know, the director said that she had a wonderful way of living life and was always super eager to work. After her internship ended, she briefly moved back to Baltimore to be with some family to, you know, be able to save money. And this is what a ton of people do after college. And so this is what she did. She was working at bars and restaurants and she was also on the board of directors for a feminist book club because she was super into politics and women's rights. Of course, she went into women's studies in college. So around a year later, Mary actually went back to Washington and began to live in an apartment with some friends. Now, this is when she got a job at the local Starbucks to start making money. And she was actually ecstatic when they promoted her to manager. She didn't see this as, you know, a stepping stone. She was really happy with everything she did in life and was proud of herself for every step. This is exactly what she loved to do. She loved to be able to plan hours, work longer hours. She loved to be able to check in on the store whenever she wanted, but she didn't abuse her power. This wasn't something she liked to hold over people's heads. In fact, she had a lot of friends at the Starbucks and they continued being friends because she was such a good boss. She cared about the employees. Her grandmother had actually bought her a 1994 Silver Saturn so she could come back to Baltimore when she wanted because she would often get homesick. She was definitely a family girl and so this made her really happy that she could go home anytime she wanted because she had her own car. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be long after that that she would never be coming home again. On July 6th, 1997, Mary went in for her shift at Starbucks. This was a night shift and she was working with two other people, 25-year-old Emery Allen Evans and 18-year-old Aaron David Goodrich. Now, Emery was actually trying to make enough money to earn his tuition to go to Howard University where he had been accepted. He was going to study music and he loved playing the horn. He was working multiple jobs at this time just to try to afford it. And he started working at Starbucks about three weeks prior. Aaron, on the other hand, was the 18 year old who had just graduated high school, but he had just recently moved to Washington to live with his father. His father helped him get a job at this Starbucks. He was trying to earn a little bit of money, but his father and him were very close. In fact, they had just gotten back from a beach vacation and Aaron had been working at the Starbucks for a few months. The day went by like normal. There was a usual rush of customers who wanted their coffee. And then by the closing time when they were doing their closing duties, none of them left. And of course, Emery's father, who he still lived with, was quite concerned that he was not home. And you see, no one would know where they had gone until the next morning. You see, at 5.15 a.m., a Starbucks worker, or a bunch of them, were getting ready to do the morning shift and they would enter the building. Before anyone knew it, there was a woman wearing a Starbucks uniform who was chasing down the Metro bus trying to get their attention. The bus stopped and the bus driver heard this woman say that there were people who had been shot. The bus driver immediately called the police and investigators arrived at this Georgetown restaurant and they found a scene that had not yet even occurred in the world. A Starbucks murder. No one thought that a simple coffee place could be a crime scene. 
this was actually a triple homicide and inside of this starbucks these three individuals were found in the cold storage room and they were all identified immediately as the workers who had done the closing duties who were emory aaron and mary they had all been shot to death but before you know investigators could even finish what they were doing at the crime scene, it was reported in the news by a local radio station that they had all been shot in the head, but one body was riddled with bullets. Now, police were still canvassing the crime scene at this point, and they found several bullet casings in the restaurant, but no weapon was found. Investigators concluded that the time of the murders was around 8 p.m. when it was closing time. However, there was no sign of forced entry. The back door was still locked. None of the doors had been broken into. None of the windows had been broken into. The alarms never went off. And the only thing that they found was a stray bullet in the ceiling of the office that they believed could have been like a warning sign to the victims. There was also a shoe print by the front door that didn't belong to any of the victims. But in the parking lot, Mary's vehicle, the Saturn that her mother or her grandmother had bought for her, was still there. And the only thing strange about that was that the front passenger side tire was flat, as though somebody had punctured it. As the bodies were carried out of the Starbucks, the other employees who had found their bodies were across the street crying and mourning for the loss and for the traumatic situation that they had just witnessed. And the entire street was actually blocked off that day until noon and none of the businesses were allowed to open in that area. The strangest thing found, however, was the fact that no money had been stolen. This wasn't a robbery gone wrong. In fact, all of the cash was still in the register and there was a safe inside the restaurant with $10,000 from the 4th of July sales. Yet, this hadn't even been attempted to be broken into. I mean, a witness from who lived in this area who frequented this Starbucks had said that he was out walking when he noticed that the lights were still on about 10 p.m. and he knew that Starbucks closed at 8. He thought this was weird, but murder didn't even cross his mind because this isn't something that happened in the area. In fact, lots of other places were open at that time of night at 10 p.m. because Georgetown was not a place where murders occurred, so nobody ever thought they had to worry about it. In fact, this was the first murder in the area in a year and a half. Another witness came forward saying they had seen Emery kind of sweeping and cleaning up around 9.15 by the door, but they had tried to go in and the door was locked. Two more residents went by at around 9.30. They saw the lights on, but nobody was inside, or so they thought. They tried to open the door and nobody answered, so they went home. No one heard gunshots that night either, which made investigators believe that they had used silencers. But the chairman and chief executive of Starbucks, who was Howard Schultz had gotten a call during a vacation and immediately ended his vacation early, flew back to Washington to take care of this. He had been called by the president of Starbucks, who was Howard Bahar, and Howard Bahar said to the public, I got the call at about three in the morning, Seattle time. It was Dean Turinga, the senior operational leader for the DC area. In our worst nightmares, we could never have imagined that out of a simple cup of coffee, we'd face a catastrophe like this. The three young people who died and the traumatic effect this tragedy had on their families, the community, and ourselves. He then went on to, of course, contact the chairman who was Howard Schultz and he immediately went to the Starbucks to speak with employees to install counseling sessions for them to go to. He also announced that security guards would be canvassing all of the Starbucks in the area and Starbucks as a company immediately offered to pay for the victims' funerals and on top of that they gave the victims' families money and they also introduced a $50,000 reward on top of the $10,000 that Georgetown had already put up for a reward. Now the autopsies revealed that they were all shot execution style. Mary was shot five times, one to her hand, the other to her face and the back of her head. She had also been found in the hallway outside of the office, while Emery had been shot in the left shoulder and then in the chest and the head. Aaron, on the other hand, was shot in the left arm and that ended up hitting his lungs and his heart. Now, Mary was found separate from Aaron and Emery, which was theorized to be because, you know, she knew the safe combination and could give that to them. However, she was placed farthest away from the safe, which 
didn't make any sense. They went to look at the cash register for the last receipt, hoping that this would lead them to a killer, but unfortunately, it was actually a purchase from one of the employees themselves. At around 8.40, one of the employees had bought a pound of coffee, so this didn't lead them anywhere either. Surveillance footage was the next place that they looked. However, Starbucks did not have surveillance themselves inside or outside the restaurant, and none of the outside surveillance from other places pointed to this area, so they had no footage of what happened. But investigators weren't at a complete loss. You see, they had been told by the assistant manager who had found the bodies that there was a possible suspect. And this was that a former employee might be involved. Investigators told the public they had a solid lead and this was true. They had found out that this former employee had stolen $300 from the cash register under Mary's watch. And because she was the manager, she knew what she needed to do. However, she was one that really liked people. She didn't want to, you know, make someone lose their job. And so she really struggled with this. And in fact, her family knew about this happening and because she didn't know whether she should fire this person give them another chance, but ultimately she knew that the right thing to do was to let them go, so she did. This seemed to investigators like the perfect motive, being fired from your job and then going back and murdering the person who fired you as a means of revenge. Now, investigators got a search warrant at this time to go and search this person's home and to also bring them in to be spoken to. And they were looking for a murder weapon. They didn't find one, and this person claimed during interrogation that they had actually paid back the $300 because they felt bad, and they were also out of town the night of the murders. This alibi allegedly checked out, and they were released. So investigators were back to square one. Then investigators got a tip from a Four Seasons hotel in the area and someone was calling to say that they had overheard a man talking on the phone about killing someone in an attempt to reach his lawyer. Unfortunately, this man was never found to be questioned, so nobody knew if he was connected to the Starbucks murders. Then forensic evidence would change the entire investigation. You see, preliminary ballistics tests were found saying that a 38 caliber revolver and a 380 caliber semi-automatic were used. These were two guns, and this meant that there could possibly be two shooters. While investigators searched for a killer or possibly killers, the reward was raised to $125,000, and people in the area actually began to request that the Starbucks be reopened, even though this had been so horrible and victims had been taken, they still wanted their coffee because there wasn't another Starbucks in the area. More than anything, I don't think this was a malicious thing or a lack of empathy. I think that this was the town wanting to feel normalcy once again, and they thought that the way to do that was to just open up the Starbucks again. But Starbucks didn't know what to do because they were actually thinking of their employees who would have to go back to work who were scared and traumatized by what happened. I will say I'm extremely surprised about how Starbucks treated their employees after all of this happened, how much they seemed to care about Mary, Aaron, and Emery, rather than, you know, taking it as something that they needed to protect their image from or that they are going to lose some money. I mean, they really seemed to care that this, these murders had happened inside their store. Howard Schultz announced at the memorial service that it would eventually reopen, but when it did, it would be a living memorial for the victims and that the profits would go to organizations preventing violence. Two months later, with no answers, America's Most Wanted aired a segment on this case and that same month, a radio station in the area reported that this case was not being well looked into by investigators and that they had failed to fully investigate the ex-employee who was fired by Mary. The radio station claimed that the alibi was not strong enough to let him go and that this suspect had a pair of shoes that had a dark stain on them that could have been blood and that this was not tested. A while later, the sergeant of the police department spoke out about this and said they have since seized these shoes to do this test and he claimed it was not blood. But 
Could this blood have been removed before the test? Could these be a different pair of shoes? Many were fearful that investigators hadn't done their job and had failed to obtain the actual killer. It was also found that this suspect had moved to California after the murders and had also hired a lawyer. At this point, the families were also coming forward saying that they had been really disappointed with the investigative skills of the department as well and that they didn't feel like they were doing enough. Mary's family claimed that they tried to tell police that Mary had been in an apartment with two different women before moving into her own apartment because they had actually kicked her out and then tried to sue her. This could be some sort of plan that they came up with to take her out. Police refused to look into these women and went with their own informant instead who said that they had a possible suspect. Their own informant actually ended up being murdered as well. You see, this was a man named Eric Butera who had come to them saying that he overheard people talking about this Starbucks case. He was a drug user and so investigators decided to give him $80 in marked bills to go to this certain house where he had heard these people talking to buy cocaine from these people and to also be able to kind of ask them some information and to try to get more out of them. However, he ended up being beaten to death in the street nearby and it was said that he actually never went into this home because nobody answered the door, but when he was walking around with this money, he was beaten up and robbed. Three men were arrested in his murder. They were Keith Mattis, Ronaldo Mathis, and Robert Walker. Now, Keith and Robert actually pled guilty to the robbery and assault, while Ronaldo was convicted of second degree murder in December. This was five months after the Starbucks murders and still nothing had been done in that case. Eric's mother then filed an $115 million lawsuit against the police and she won and was granted $98 million for police negligence negligence, only for it to be reduced to 1.1 million because the U.S. Appeals or Court of Appeals ruled that the jury lacked legal foundations. Nonetheless, many knew that the wrongdoings were occurring within the police department and unfortunately, it was not a surprise to anyone that these Starbucks murders had not been solved. However, investigators had received a very important tip from the America's Most Wanted segment. The problem was there was no evidence to prove that this suspect that was given to them was guilty. So the case continued to haunt the town of Georgetown and that is when a theory began to form. This had to do with Mary's time being a White House intern. This theory was because there was this huge internet conspiracy about Clinton's body count. They believed that anyone who was an associate, a witness, or a friend of the Clintons would end up murdered. But Mary was on a pretty low level to be considered Clinton's associate. However, there was a connection between the Clintons and this actual Starbucks store because before her death, Mary had been working at the Starbucks when Chelsea Clinton, Bill and Hillary's daughter, actually walked in and ordered a coffee. And so Mary actually paid for her coffee for her and ended up calling all of her friends to say that she had just paid for the president's daughter's coffee. She was really excited. And although she was a very low level intern, it was said it was possible that Mary did have contact with the president because President Clinton around this time was said to be having an affair with a White House intern. This was a woman named Monica. And allegedly, during a meeting to discuss this affair with the press, this Monica lady had said that she didn't want to end up like Katie Mahoney or Mary. Mary was huge into politics, standing up for what she believed in. She organized rallies for feminists and formed women's issues discussion groups to talk about sexual assault and domestic violence against women. She was also a member of a political activist group called the Baltimore Lesbian Avengers, and she wanted to fight for injustices done to women. Now, during a festival called Gay Games and Cultural Festival, Mary had reportedly said, this is exactly what I was hoping for. It's one big gay world. She was said to identify as a lesbian, meaning that the theory of her possibly having an affair with Bill was quite slim and not probably as likely. However, some speculated that maybe she wasn't having an affair. Maybe it was that she was the one who spoke out about Monica having an affair with the president because it was said that the person who leaked it 
had the initial M and was a White House intern. Some others thought that it could possibly be the fact that Mary was thought to be a person that a whole bunch of these White House interns could come to to talk about the wrongdoings happening inside the White House. These two theories were theorized to be why someone would have wanted to put a hit out on her. But as much as Mary was the type to fight for women's safety, she didn't really appear to be scared of the world. And her mother said that she would go on the bus alone at night, she would run at night, she worked the closing shifts all the time, she lived alone, she wasn't really scared of the dark. And as much as her family tried to talk her out of this, they said that she just wouldn't have been Katie or Mary if she didn't do these things. It's what they loved about her, that she wasn't fearful of the world like everybody else. In fact, her mother remembered when she was younger, she was just a little girl and she was just as brave. In fact, her older brother was actually scared to go up to his room that was upstairs because of the boogeyman. And so Mary was the one to check upstairs for him to make sure that he wasn't up there and going to get him. So Mary went up there all by herself and checked to make sure this boogeyman wasn't going to get her family because she was not going to allow that to happen. Her mother also said that she believed that Mary would have had compassion for the person who killed her. She also didn't believe that these murders had anything to do with what was going on in Mary's personal life because she told her mother everything. In fact, her mother claimed that the only time Mary had ever snuck around or not told her mother anything was when her mother had given her extra clothes in high school to go on a trip. And instead of wearing those clothes, Mary returned them to get the money in order to buy presents for her family on this trip. Everything she did was for other people. It really did seem that way. But her family has since created the Mary Catherine Mahoney Fund at her high school and her stepmother has said, the horror of it is we lose a person who could have contributed to society and we still have whoever took her. Seven months later and still without a killer in custody, the Starbucks was reopened on February 20th, 1998. And at this point, it was also reported by a newspaper, the Washington Post, that the integrated ballistics identification system was backlogged, meaning that the bullets and shell casings from weapons of the same calibers of guns that were used in the Starbucks murders had not been tested to see if they were the murder weapons, meaning they could have the murder weapon in custody and be able to connect it to somebody and they hadn't done it yet because it was backlogged. There were over 2,000 of these awaiting testing. And if this was just a rumor, like some people, you know, tried to say, oh, maybe the media is just trying to make police look bad, except the fact that the assistant police chief immediately ordered an analyst on all bullets and shell casings for the Starbucks murders the next day. Exactly four months after that, America's Most Wanted actually re-aired the segment about this case, and this would lead to another tip. However, this turned out to be a tip they had already been given, yet they were going to have a new look at it now. You see, a woman had contacted the police when the segment first aired. She claimed that her boyfriend had a friend who claimed to kill three kids. She then didn't know what to do, told her mother, and her mother told her to contact the police, which she did. And the next day she was in a meeting with Detective Jim Tranium, who had already heard this man's name. But that is when she told him his full name was Carl Derek Haverd Cooper. He had already heard this name because on September 28th, he had gotten a call from an ID number 234 saying that these Starbucks murders were done by two guys, one being Carl. They said that this Carl had killed before and that he used a partner for robberies and that his last partner had given up his name, so he killed him. They said this Carl lived on Galantine Street SE with his family and they didn't give a full name, but this Detective Jim was able to trace this to a Carl Cooper. He was also already a main suspect in the murder of his partner, who was Monty Goodman, because he was the man who outed Carl for this robbery and Carl then had to serve a two-year sentence because of that 
for the robbery that happened in 1989. That wasn't the only thing on this Carl Cooper's criminal record though. He was also being looked into for the shooting of an off-duty police officer named Bruce Howard the year prior to the Starbucks murders. An inmate called the police and claimed that Carl had called them right after shooting this officer saying he killed an officer, but Bruce actually ended up surviving and he was shot with a nine millimeter gun which was found to be the same gun that Carl's wife had registered to her. They were still currently trying to connect Carl to this officer's shooting, but Detective Jim then decided to postpone that case in order to pursue Carl as the main suspect in the Starbucks murders because he would get more time for three murders than just the shooting of an officer. So, they ended up wiretapping his phone, installed cameras around his house, and the detective then went to Carl's wife's mother's house, who they thought had contact with Carl, and they questioned her about contact with her daughter and Carl, and she claimed she didn't have any contact with them, yet as soon as the police left, she called them, and they had that on record because they wiretapped his phone. This detective had gone there because he wanted to tell her that they were investigating a recovered gun that had the serial numbers removed, and they thought that it was possibly Carl's. But strangely enough, after hearing this, Carl called the police and told them that they could have his wife's gun to inspect. They still had the gun, and they could have it whenever they wanted. They ended up seizing it as evidence, and when they did, when they came to Carl's home to seize it, he called 911 to complain that officers were taking his gun. Obviously, that was within their rights, and they found that the shells actually matched the casings in Bruce Howard's case. They believed that this really could have been the gun who shot him, and Carl could have been the man to shoot him. But even though they believed they had him for this crime, they didn't have him for the Starbucks murders yet. So they put off arresting him for that and they wired a friend of his to go and talk to him to try to get him to confess. But all he said was, I don't know, I don't care because as my, as my hand to God on my father's grave on my son's life, I had nothing to do with these Starbucks. That's a place of business. I done been in that mother effer. With his new tip on Carl, from the America's Most Wanted being re-aired and this woman calling again on March 1st, 1999, he was arrested for the shooting of Bruce Howard because they believed they could also get him to confess to the Starbucks murders. He was 29 years old at this time and they really hoped to get him for more than just a shooting. He was questioned for six hours and 41 minutes until three in the morning. And it was said that he was asked about the Starbucks murders and Carl claimed that, his wasn't, that it wasn't his style, but two associates of his asked him for advice on whether to do it and he told them not to. But then after some questioning, he then just said, I'm in it for life, I'm in dirt. You're going to charge me with Starbucks. And then after a while, he did confess to the shooting of Bruce after seeing him have sex with a woman in a parked car and they got into an argument and his gun fell out of his pocket and shot the officer. He said it was all an accident and as far as the Starbucks murders, he took a polygraph test and showed signs of deception. And this is when investigators brought up a piece of information that they had found. It could really make him confess. This was the fact that he knew a man named Keith Boo Covington and so did one of the victims named Emery. And then when they told him that they knew this, that is when Carl began to say that the murders were an inside job, that Keith was the killer and that he was just the driver. He confessed that it was just a robbery gone wrong and he hadn't even known about the murders until the next day on the news. This made sense though, because the first tip had said that there were two men involved with the murders and Keith and Carl made too. So investigators then let him go to sleep after this confession, but when he woke up, he changed his story. He claimed he was actually inside, but he didn't shoot anybody. And then Carl said that Keith put a gun to Emery's head, who allegedly knew what was happening at this point, and told the other employees, Mary and Aaron, to cooperate so they could rob them. But Carl then said that Kevin got into an argument with Mary over opening the safe. She didn't want to. And then two shots rang out. He didn't see anything. And then he said 
They both fled after that. He also wrote in this statement that he was sorry for their deaths. But Keith Covington was then arrested as well, and he denied everything. He said that it was the perfect setup that to make him look like he was the killer when he wasn't, and he also had a gunshot wound in the stomach for whatever reason, but he was released, and Carl was told this, that Keith was not involved, and that is when he confessed to killing Mary, Aaron, and Emery alone. He wrote that he forced everyone into the back room. He shot at the ceiling to warn them, but the female, who was Mary, then ran. And when he caught her, they fought, and Carl said that the gun went off and shot her, and then he panicked and just started shooting everyone. He said he left without actually taking the money because he just wanted to run. He said he only lied because he was afraid of going to jail. At this point, Carl also claimed to bury the guns outside of a St. Anne's infant home, but these were never found. Four days after being arrested, Carl was being charged with three counts of first degree felony murder. But this is when he recanted all of his statements, saying that he just said whatever investigators wanted him to say. However, a week before the trial, Carl would plead guilty to 47 federal charges including the Starbucks murders. The plea bargain meant that he wouldn't get the death penalty and he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. It was said about Carl that you could detect a demon inside of his body. Now, Aaron's mother said that she didn't think that there would ever be closure because Aaron was never coming back. Mary's mother said that Mary had an enormous promise and that was the sadness of it all. Mary's sister asked, why God takes the angels and leaves the rest. But do you believe this case is really solved? That Carl is really guilty? That he worked alone? That he murdered those three? There's a lot of speculation in this case of this being a mess up as far as investigators and that they ultimately convicted the wrong person just to get a conviction. I mean, lots of people say that you know, the conspiracy about the, the being the White House intern, having something to do with it really does make this case seem more fictional than real life, which I can see, you know. I don't think that really has anything to do with it, and I think focusing on that makes it seem not very legit and makes you not want to look at the actual facts of it. So just taking that out of the picture, do you think that investigators let the real killer go when they let go of that ex-employee. I hope that Carl is not imprisoned for something he didn't do. At the same time, I hope that they caught the right person because these victims' families deserve that. I'm very pleased with how Starbucks handled this because they could have definitely taken this as, we need to cover this up, our image needs to be better than this. You know, we can't have people knowing a murder happened in our store because of course people can be scared of then going to the restaurant. But I think they did a wonderful job at really caring about their employees, and I think it really does say a lot. I think it's just heartbreaking to me that these three individuals who were just trying to make a living had to be taken out of this world for no reason. This wasn't even a robbery. No money was even taken. And that's what, to me, makes this seem more like revenge than a random hit from this Carl Cooper. Because even though he said he just ran without the money, I guess that is possible if he accidentally killed everybody and was panicking, but I don't know, it just seems more like a revenge hit, especially with the amount of bullets that entered their bodies. But I'd love to know what you think, and remember to come back Sunday at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time for another video for October, and make sure to get some merch if you like it, because I am absolutely obsessed with it. It's my favorite. If you want some, it will be linked down below or at teespring.com slash Brooke McKenna. Okay, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.